Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Welcome to the uh, another virtual uh, show from the planetarium of the Sharjah Academy for Astronomy, Space Sciences and Technology. Uh, today, as usual, we shall uh, take you for a journey through space and time. And after that, we shall be discussing a few things about space telescopes. Not exactly space telescopes for the eyes, but also we're going to talk, talk about telescopes that observe the universe using the radio uh, spectrum. So today's main lecture is going to be about telescopes of radio. It will be presented by Mr. Muhammad Hani, who is a planetarium show host, who is an astronomer, who is a science guide uh, at the Sharjah Academy for Astronomy, Space Science and Technology, and also myself, Ahmed Salahuddin. I'll be taking you for this journey and then handing it over to Mr. Muhammad for talks about the radio telescopes. Before we start the show, I'd like to bring to your attention about tomorrow's very important event, the partial uh, solar eclipse that's going to happen uh, from the UAE. From the UAE, it's going to be a partial solar eclipse. From the other regions in the world, specifically, uh, there's going to be an annular solar eclipse. So uh, the ones who are lucky enough to be in those locations will see the uh, sun forming a shape of a ring around the moon. And uh, the others, for example, people in Sharjah or Dubai or UAE will be seeing uh, a partial solar eclipse, which will cover up the sun from a certain point, but a few points of the sun will be uh, visible. Let's now start our journey. As you can see, we can uh, notice how beautiful the Earth is. We are going around the Earth right now in an orbit like an astronaut in a spaceship. And now we shall land on the Earth, specifically on the city of Sharjah. So let's see how uh, the sky of Sharjah looks like. And I'd like to show you how the sky and the stars look. And after that, I shall uh, show you some objects of the sky. Well, we have now landed on Sharjah and this is how the sky of Sharjah looks like. Many stars, obviously, because we have gone far away from the city of Sharjah. We are in the desert of Sharjah and we can see these many stars. I would like to show you a little more of the sky so you can see how this place looks like. We are now pointing towards a specific direction, but I don't know exactly which direction. So on the left hand side here, we can see the uh, brightness from the sunset. It's still uh, up there. So let's move the time a little bit forwards and you can see the brightness disappearing. There you go. This is how the sky moves beautifully from uh, the simulation that we're showing right now. The planetarium, the good thing is that we can control time. So right now it's a virtual show. Uh, I would like to invite you to the planetarium, the actual planetarium where I'm sitting at right now. And I wish you were here. We could see the sky in the beautiful screen that we have, the 360 dome, 18 meters in uh, diameter. But unfortunately, due to the pandemic, we are now doing this virtual show. Inshallah, once everything cools down and we return back to the health and safety, we shall invite you to this show and you can watch the sky actually from here, physically being here. All right, so this is how the sky looks like. And you can see in this region, you can see some dust and this dust is actually the dust of uh, the Milky Way galaxy. We are inside the Milky Way galaxy, but some parts of the Milky Way galaxy will not be visible because we are rotating on the Earth and some parts of the Earth, we cannot see the entire Milky Way galaxy, but we can see a part of it. And this is how it looks like. Now I'd like to uh, show you a few things that the ancestors did with the sky. We have a beautiful sky filled with stars. And from the Earth, we can see up to 5,000 visible stars from the Northern Hemisphere. So what did the astronomers do with these stars? How did they use these stars to find directions? So let's start with that specific point. We'll use something called an asterism. What is an asterism? There you go. This, what you see in front of you right now, is called an asterism. An asterism is a group of stars inside a constellation. So you can notice the difference between an asterism and a constellation. A constellation is a complete shape of uh, a group of stars forming together, for example, the Big Dipper, uh, so the Big Bear or the uh, Small Bear or Hercules or so many like that. But an asterism is something that forms inside of the, uh, of the constellation. So this is what you see right now is an asterism, which is called the Big Dipper. It belongs to the constellation called the Ursa Major. And now we can see how the Ursa Major looks like. The entire Ursa Major looks like that. But we shall not talk about the rest of the constellation. We just want this part of it. Why this part? I'll let you know right now. Because this part of the constellation 
can guide you to find the northern direction. What is the northern direction? We have four directions, the east, the west, the north, and the south. Using the Ursa Major, we can actually find out where is the north pole or the northern direction by extending a line from these two stars all the way about six times this distance between these two stars, which is called Muraq and Dubba. By the way, those are Arabic names. More than 200 stars in the sky are named in Arabic. Even the stars in the constellation of Ursa Major. All seven of them are actually made named in the Arabic language. If you extend the line like this, we'll be able to see that it reaches to a star called Polaris. Polaris is the most important star in the night sky, according to me, because it can actually tell you where your location is. Also, it can tell you where you're heading. You're heading north or south or east or west. Let's say that you are in Sharjah, because this right now what you can see is Sharjah. So uh, how do you confirm from the Polaris star that you are in Sharjah? There's a line called the Meridian Line. It starts from zero right here, and it goes all the way to 90 and then back to zero. So it splits the sky into the eastern half and the western half. Notice where Polaris is. It's about 24.5 degrees, so let's say it's about 25 degrees, and that is the latitude of the city of Sharjah. But you might ask me, when the sky changes, when the time moves forward, doesn't Polaris change its location? That's the amazing thing about star Polaris. It always stays at the same position according to us because we rotate in a way that we keep the Polaris star stable. Before we move the sky, I'll tell you where is Polaris. It's in a constellation called Ursa Minor, which is actually the little bear, like exactly looking like the big bear. And this is the little bear. And now we shall move the time forward fast and see how Polaris stays exactly in the same position. Notice how the sky is moving, but Polaris is not changing its position because we rotate in a way that we keep Polaris always as the uh, the point where the axis of rotation of the Earth is pointing at. Let's keep moving the uh, sky and you can notice how Polaris is exactly at that point. That is how the sky moves. Let's now stop the time. Let's take off the meridian line and let's see some other line or the system of lines called the alt azimuth line. As you can see, the sky is filled with grids because we have created a map for the sky using uh, the stars and using the space in the sky. So now we, what we see right now is called the alt azimuth. From this kind of a simulation, we can actually point out any uh, object in the sky and point out its location exactly like we are putting a dot on the graph paper. That's the alt azimuth line. And now I'd like to show you the uh, history or the uh, first gallery that was made, the artistic gallery that was made by the ancestors using the uh, stars. Let's now look at how the constellations were formed. These are the constellations that were formed, that were designed by the ancestors. And these constellations helped us in making a map for the sky. Notice how beautiful that uh, system of constellations is. Let's move the time now and see how the rest of the constellations show up. Some constellations are called the zodiac constellations, which pass through something called the ecliptic line. The yellow line, the yellow constellations are called the zodiac constellations, as you can notice. And through the zodiac constellations, we can understand the motion of the sun. But these constellations also have uh, images behind them. Now, those images were formed by the ancestors to make it easier for us to remember the constellations, also to remember where they are located, and from there we can figure out the map for the sky. These are the shapes of the constellations. Wonderful history, wonderful beginnings of the observations of the sky started from this imaginations of the ancestors. We have 88 constellations in total, but we cannot see all of them from the Northern Hemisphere because the sky does not really show us the entire uh, southern hemisphere. We have to go to a country, for example, we have to go to Australia or we have to go to New Zealand to actually see the rest of the constellations or the southern hemisphere constellations. The names of the constellations obviously are, are given through uh, the Greek 
or other uh, uh, civilizations like the Roman, Chinese, Indian civilizations. These are the names of the constellations as we can see. As the time goes forward, we can see here Cepheus, we can see Cassiopeia, the queen, we can see Ursa Minor again. Notice how the Polaris is still at the same exact point. Here we can see Triangulum, here we can see Cygnus, the Northern Cross, which where the first black hole was discovered in this region. Lyra, which has a very nice star called Vega, which is a very bright star in the night sky. As we are in the summer sky, these constellations are visible very much because now we are in the summertime. Lyra, Cygnus, uh, these constellations actually show up really bright in the night sky of the summertime from Sharjah or the UAE. So that was our journey with the stars. And you can see on the right hand side, the star, the main star that we know of is coming up, which is the sun. And as the sun rises up, all the constellations will disappear because the sun is too bright for the constellations to uh, stay bright or the stars to stay bright in the sky. And now we shall move to the second st stage of our journey, which is a journey in space. And for that, we shall listen to a short countdown from the Apollo 11 mission that happened around 50 years ago, 1969, uh, which marked the beginning of mankind on the moon. So let's listen to that nostalgic uh, countdown. And from there, we shall launch from Sharjah to the outer space. All the second stage tanks now pressurized. 35 seconds and counting. We are still go 30 seconds and counting. Astronauts report it feels good. T minus 25 seconds. Prepare for launch, everybody. 20 seconds and counting. T minus 15 seconds. Guidance is internal. 12, 11, 10, 9. Ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. A very smooth launch from Sharjah to the outer space. And now we are looking at the Earth from the outer space like astronauts. We are no longer on the Earth. We are now in the outer space looking at the entire planet, how it looks like if we are about 16,000 kilometers away exactly. We can see the stars. If you want, we can actually see the constellations too from the outer space. Notice how the Earth is almost 70% water bodies from big oceans. The rest of the Earth are, is occupied by human beings. From this space, from this wonderful music, we feel peaceful. And that's what it was supposed to be on Earth, peace. But unfortunately, some elements have not been exactly the way we expected on Earth. But let's pray together for a bigger peaceful time and let's start our journey from the earth to the outer space as mr muhammad will be explaining about the solar eclipse i'd like to show you how it looks like if we were in space let's go to the moon and see how the earth would actually uh, the people of the earth would actually see the solar eclipse as you can see, we are now passing by the Earth, going towards the Moon. If the Moon comes in between the Earth and the Sun, in a specific location, that's when the eclipse happens. Look at that. So now the Earth is there and the Moon is right there. As we go closer to the Moon, and if we move the time a little bit forward, we can see the motion of the Moon in front of the Sun, and that is how the total eclipse happens. But tomorrow we're going to have a partial eclipse in which the sun is not going to be covered completely, but only a specific part of it. Let's continue our journey from the Earth and the Moon system. We'll talk about the eclipse in detail after the show and after the journey. 
we are now traveling faster and faster towards the outer space on the way to the outer space we shall actually see the rest of the planets i shall enlarge the planets to 1000 times to make them more visible from this distance here we have enlarged the planets to 1000 times that's the beautiful thing about planetarium so we can actually control the dimensions we can actually control the time and we can actually simulate whatever we want with the space notice the planets here we are the inner planets four of them orbiting the sun at a very high speed because the inner planets are faster than the outer planets because of the high gravitational pull of the sun these are the four inner planets beautifully shown the sun at the center mercury venus almost size of the earth we call it the sister of the earth but it's very hot in there more than 450 degrees celsius the average temperature of the venus planet and here we have the our mission which is mars uae will be sending a probe by next month to orbit the planet Mars. Not going to land on it, but it's going to orbit it. It's called the Probe of Hope, Ms. Bar Al Amel. Then we have a very empty area between Mars and Jupiter. Don't think it's empty. It is not. It's filled with asteroids. More than 1.5 million asteroids orbit around the Sun in this region. Each of them acting like independent moons, but they're not around planets, so we don't call them moons, but they don't qualify to become planets. That's why we call them asteroids, because one right now. Uh, it's Vesta, it used to be Ceres, but Ceres is now considered to be a dwarf planet along with four others. Let's keep going further away and further away. Notice how we can see Saturn, we can see Jupiter with the rings. Saturn with the rings is right here. We can see the rest of the planets, we can see Uranus. Soon it will show up right here. And we can see Neptune. But that is not the end of the solar system. We have another belt called the Kuiper belt that comes after the orbit of Neptune. There are more asteroids there, some comets, and also the rest of the dwarf planets, including Pluto and three others. But do you think this is the end of the solar system? I don't think so. Because we have another belt, actually. It's called another uh, cloud, called the Oort cloud, which we shall see as we leave the solar system behind. For educational purposes, I shall keep the constellations open or on because I want to see how constellations change shape as we leave the solar system. Let's look at Oort Cloud. It's a big cloud where the uh, comets, the rest of the comets come from. It's the source of comets. Notice how the constellations will change shape as we move further away from our solar system. Look at the Oort cloud forming. Once we leave the Oort cloud, we have crossed about one light year. And from there, we can't really see the solar system because it becomes too small. And we only see stars moving. Look at Lyra. Vega has started moving. Isis have moved. Cepheus is moving. And all the constellations start changing shape. And now we're about to exit the Milky Way galaxy. Notice how the constellations have no meaning anymore because constellations are valid only if we are inside the solar system. We are leaving. And now it's time to visit our Milky Way.
waves and microwaves. But uh, for the other uh, electromagnetic sp spectrum, uh, the atmosphere blocked uh, uh, this uh, electromagnetic spectrum as the gamma rays, the X-ray, the ultraviolet, because it's uh, uh, very dangerous for us. As you can see in the picture, it uh, blocked it. Uh, for the visible light, it's okay. Uh, everything uh, can come uh, normally. Uh, but for the infrared also, it blocked some uh, waves, some uh, a band of the uh, uh, infrared. But as you can see, the radio waves is completely as the visible wave. It become all uh, full. Uh, it's tra uh, fully transparent uh, for the atmosphere. And that's why we can put a huge radio telescope uh, on the ground uh, to see another shape uh, of uh, the object in the universe, as you, as you can see now. The radio waves uh, go from the frequency, go from uh, 3 kilohertz to 300 kilohertz. And the microwave, which we'll see later, from one millimeter to 25 micrometers. And uh, as you can see here, uh, the atmosphere can keep some uh, uh, waves coming uh, through the atmosphere, but uh, uh, for the others, it's impossible. That's why we, we named this the windows of the universe. As you can see here, the radio waves come completely down, the infrared little done, little bit, the visible light completely as the radio waves, but for the others, the ultraviolet, the X-ray, gamma, as I tell you, it's not possible, fortunately for us, because it's hurting for us, uh, especially for the ultraviolet, for example. Uh, Alhamdulillah, we have here the uh, 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 ozone ray. The ozone ray, it protects us from the ultraviolet uh, radiation. And uh, what is the goal of uh, uh, the windows of the universe is bringing the electromagnetic waves, the high energy particles, gravitational waves together to study more the universe and the probe event in real time in a way that was previously impossible before. As you can see here, the, this is a radio telescope on the ground. It can kept the, uh, uh, capture the, the radio waves from the outer space. The radio waves now, the observation are possible possible from the Earth's surface with a very huge radio telescope. But everything now was started in 1870 with Clark Maxwell when he discovered, he predicted the existence of the radio waves. But Ernest Hertz in 1886, he make the, the experience uh, uh, of the Maxwell, of Clark Maxwell to uh, produce uh, and make a production and a reception of uh, radio waves. And after that, as you can see, we have a special, special, specialized antenna and receiver used to capt all the uh, radio waves from the outer space. In 19, uh, 1933, Karl Jansky, he discovered he, the radio waves coming from the, because he was an engineer, he discovered some, uh, some waves coming from the outer space and uh, by his, uh, his first uh, radio telescope, you can see this is very, very base radio telescope, not as uh, we, we, we can see now as a parabola. And uh, in 1937, the, the first uh, man who uh, really uh, constructed, uh, he made a radio telescope was Groot River. He make really a radio telescope as we can see now as a parabola, and he was uh, and he discovered uh, the microwave background as uh, predicted by Georges Lemaitre. Uh, in 1951, uh, uh, the two men, the two scientists, Harold Even Edward, they detected the 21 centimeter line of nitrogen by the radio telescope also hydrogen. 1963, Arnus Benzians and Wilson, they discover the fossil radiation of the Big Bang. Uh, and as, as we will see now in the end, this is the, uh, the uh, really the trace, uh, the, fossil, the fossil radiation of the universe of the Big Bang. In 65, the microwave background was discovered, of course, by the Georges Lemaitre. And in 1967, Jocelyn Bell, 
she discovered the first pulsar by the radio telescope also. And uh, in 1974, uh, the Nobel, uh, Nobel Prize uh, was given to Anthony, his director, the director of Josen, Josen Bell, and he get uh, the Nobel Prize. And from this time, from 1974, we can say uh, the era of the radio astronomy, the big uh, dish of the radio astronomy was begun with now in 19, it's not very far from 1974 to 1980 with a very huge uh, net uh, of uh, large array telescope and Alama 2013. This is really changed everything, our vision completely of the universe because we get a new image of the universe. And as you can see, uh, in the outer space also, there is so many uh, telescopes, the, the, the space telescope uh, working in the other wavelengths, in the infrared, in the ultraviolet, in the uh, microwave, in the gamma ray also, not only on the ground. And here we can see the huge telescope uh, constructed on the Earth, the large telescope uh, Portio in uh, Arecibo, in Puerto Rico, 300 meters, the biggest uh, telescope. By this telescope, we send uh, the, uh, the uh, you know, the message to the outer space. If there is any intelligent uh, uh, civilization from this telescope, radio telescope, we send this message. Uh, China, uh, they, they, they tried to construct another one, uh, similar to this one, but 500 uh, meters. But uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, it's still an operational now uh, because it needs a lot of uh, big complex, uh, human complex to work here inside. And now we will go to the microwave uh, astronomy. Of course, microwave astronomy, we get it. It's shorter than the, it's a type of uh, radio, radio, also radio wave, but shorter than the radio wave. It's go from one millimeter to 100 centimeter while the radio waves go from one millimeter to 100 kilometers. And by the, the, the telescope, uh, for example, the COPE telescope, which in the, is in the outer space, we could uh, take an image of the, U, of the whole universe, uh, the, what we name the CMB, electromagnetic radiation. And this is as the remnant from the early stage of the universe. And of course, as I tell you, Benzias and uh, Robert Wilson, they discovered by accident uh, the, uh, 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 you know, the, uh, this is the, the, the sound, if we want to say, oh, something from coming from the outer space. It was really uh, the trace of the remnant uh, of this uh, Big Bang, which happened 13.8 uh, billion years ago. Uh, that's why now the, the CMB is the faint cosmic background radiation filling all space, and the glow is strongest. That's why the microwave was important to detect this region by the uh, from of the radio uh, spectrum. Uh, this is another image of the cosmic microwave background. It was really the evidence, the landmark, the evidence of the Big Bang. Uh, detected by the microwave telescope, uh, and it's filled, as I tell you, all the uh, the universe from everywhere. And this is the uh, the evidence of the hydrogen plasma, which started from the beginning after the the Big Bang. And uh, when the universe cooled enough, proton and electron combined to form natural hydrogen atoms. And uh, fortunately with our uh, telescope, our radio telescope, we uh, could take this uh, beautiful image to the universe. And uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mohammed. Uh, before we uh, go to the next step, I'd like to just add one information about the yes. telescopes of radio. Uh, the first image of the black hole actually was taken using a uh, very uh, complex network of telescope, radio telescopes around the world, uh, which people think the image of the black hole is actually a picture taken by a camera, but that's not a picture taken by a camera. It's actually an image processed by information that was taken from radio telescopes, from radio telescopes, and then uh, used computers to model it into a picture of the black hole that we saw last year. 
So that's a very nice application of what we use around uh, with the telescopes of radio. And now coming to tomorrow's very big event, which is the solar eclipse. Mr. Mohammed, are you ready for it? Yes, just... Uh... Are you going to take your telescopes out and uh, take pictures? <laughs> of, of no, course. I will, I will go for Stellarium. We'll make, uh, fortunately, <laughs> for, for tomorrow, uh, if yes. we can uh, wake up at uh, 5 o'clock, we can see uh, this uh, phenomena. But uh, now, 8 o'clock, I think. Uh, it will start 8 o'clock, but we have yes. to be ready before. Of course, now yes. I will go for tomorrow. Okay, before we start the simulation, I also like to mention that uh, you have to be very careful not to look at the eclipse with your eyes because the sun anyway is yes. dangerous if you look at it without anything. If an eclipse happens, the sun will still be strong. So please don't look at the eclipse with your direct yes. eyes. Use uh, glasses, which is not uh, this kind of glass, but a spe special glass which can be used for uh, the eclipse observation. Uh, yes, if we can I see the go, simulation yes. now. Now we shall use another yes. software an open source software called Stellarium, which is free download. You can download it on your desktop or your Mac, uh, depending on what you have. This, tele this software can actually show you a lot of ways to simulate uh, the phenomenon of uh, the universe by using uh, live simulation, by using uh, software. So let's now see uh, a, a simulation uh, shown for that, uh, the eclipse of tomorrow. Yes. Uh, yes, this is now at uh, uh, four o'clock. Now I will uh, push the time here. Uh, I will go with a minute here. I will go really for the yes, I will go for five o'clock here as we can see the glare of the sun, uh, some constellation in the morning, Venus, we have Venus in the Taurus constellation. And Mr. now Muhammad, I will- you, uh, yes? uh, share the, the uh, stellarium? Ah, okay. Uh, Please sorry, share I share it. Yes. Share. Let's okay. see the uh, simulation live. Yes, where is the... Yes, this is the Taurus constellation. Yes, yes, okay now. Yes, now I can see it, yes. Okay. Uh, yes, I mean, it's five o'clock now. Twenty. This is uh, tomorrow, 21st. And uh, exactly five o'clock, we can see the glare of the sun, uh, Venus, some constellation. And uh, I will see, I will now, I, I will start to push the time forward to see, no, no really here for, uh, it's nine o'clock. Okay, this is six here. And I will go by the minutes. Yeah, I will push the minutes. Just a little up. Yes. And I now I will make, now I will go uh, zoom in. Now I will uh, little push the time above. From here to start, really. Okay, look at now. This is the moon here, and I will push for the time forward. You will see now. Uh, I will put the ecliptic. Sorry for that. Ecliptic line. Yes, this is the ecliptic line. And on the ecliptic line, we have to see, uh, we must see uh, the phenomena happened uh, when, when the three object aligned on the, the same, uh, uh, this line, ecliptic line from now we are uh, looking from the Earth, and uh, now the Moon, the, this is the, the new Moon, will uh, pass in front of the Sun, as you can see now. And uh, the, at 8 o'clock, it will start the eclipse. So at this point, this will is, it completely yes, cover the point, Sun? This, yes, this is the partial eclipse from Sharjah. Yes. 
from uh, I think from uh, from Yemen, from Sana'a, we yeah. can see uh, uh, an annual eclipse, and as you can see now, uh, we're still moving the time. At uh, I think at 11 o'clock, uh, the phenomena will finish here. So it's not gonna give us complete darkness because no. it's not a total solar yes. eclipse. Yes, at 11, exactly 11:16, everything will uh, will finish, and uh, I I hope that tomorrow everyone uh, can see this phenomena uh, because it will uh, maybe not seen not be seen uh, in the uh, following years, and it's very important to 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 see this uh, to have uh, uh, th this phenomena. Uh, by the next eye also by using the telescope also uh, thank you very much and uh, now i return again to mr ahmed thank you so much mr Mohammed, for the amazing uh, simulation through stellarium and uh, here we mark uh, the end of today's uh, journey and today's uh, presentation thank you mr Mohammed, again and thank you for everyone who joined in uh, and uh, hopefully inshallah very soon we shall be uh, inviting you all to the actual planetarium at the Sharjah Academy for Astronomy, Space Sciences and Technology, where we can actually sit and watch the stars, the constellations, the movies that we have. And uh, I hope that happens soon. Until then, we shall continue with these uh, virtual uh, shows that we'll have every Friday and Saturday at 8 p.m. exactly. So fast Friday shows are going to be in Arabic and the Saturday shows are going to be in English. And I hope you join us every week because every week we have different topics. Uh, next week, we're going to talk about uh, women in astronomy. And the week after, we're going to talk about stellar birth and death, which is going to be the story of the stars. And I hope every one of you join in. And again, thank you for coming today for today's show. And here I am, Ahmed. And Mr. Mohammed, we're going to sign off uh, from Sharjah Academy for Astronomy, Space Sciences and Technology. Thank you so much. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night.